Uh, I am indeed a data scientist, and I hope not to bring up too many equations right now, just show you some pretty pictures. Uh, so I'm a data scientist at a New York City studio uh, called Betaworks. We build a number of products that you may have heard of, including Dig, Chartbeat, Bitly, SocialFlow. Uh, some of the recent things that uh, we've launched are an animated GIF search engine, which is amazing. Um, so go check it out. They have an amazing API too. But a, a lot of what we do is play um, with different aspects of data, social data especially, and, and, and media, and the, the future of media. So really thinking through a lot of these uh, topics that have been discussed throughout the day. And um, so what do I do as a data scientist? Well, apparently it's one of the sexiest jobs in the, in the industry right now. But I think what most of you don't realize is that this is what my screen looks like most of the day. Um, and I love that, I think it's great. But a lot, I spend a lot of my time trying to clean up data, make sense of data, uh, and unfortunately very little of it actually working on you know, the models and the insight part, which is uh, the most fun part. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of the, my output is um, in new products, so finding interesting ways to use the data that we have access to today to power really interesting features or, re or new products around media. Uh, and the other is answering questions. So whether it's on the business side, uh, I work with a lot of journalists to answer questions about what's going on in social media. How are people responding to issue X or Y? And I think uh, that's what's so fascinating about this time, and I'm so excited to be working in this field, uh, is this, the promise of what we can do. Um, it's the first time that we've ever had access to this type of information. Like, what are people attentive to? What are the topics that are, that are really catching on? Uh, we've never been able to see that. It's always been sort of within uh, the, the corporations who own the audiences, right? So now we have this view into what's going on. What are people consuming? What's engaging them? And how are they interconnected? And uh, like a, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this data that comes from these social spaces, uh, they're what social scientists call status affordances, right? So, so there are different markers of status, and apparently as, you know, as humans, we like to compare ourselves. I have more followers than you. Uh, I have more shares than you. My article got more likes than yours, right? So all these affordances across different social networks give us the ability to quantify things that we really want to quantify, like our own popularity, right? But w what do they actually mean? But it's, it's actually, when you get to it, uh, to, to, to try to understand, what does it mean that something has a higher cloud score than another? And that, that the fact that it changes within a day, is that actually meaningful or, or what does it reflect, right? So we have all these, all these data points which are super interesting. It's the first time that we've had access to them. Uh, but we're, we're trying to understand how to use them and how to find meaning. Uh, and these are so, so, these have become so popular, these, these status affordances, that they've uh, started to create these markets. So people are buying followers, they're buying Instagram uh, likes, right? For $5, you could get 4,000 Twitter followers by tomorrow, right? That's a great deal, right? Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, services. It's, it's a Japanese, Japanese service that not only gives you new followers, but also uh, creates uh, tweets for them that are like yours. So it mines the language that you tend to use in your Twitter, in your tweets, and then it sort of creates these weird uh, tweets, like plus one, lovely foods and company, hosted by good job on SEO, guys. <laughs> kind of makes sense, you know, if, if you were skimming uh, a feed. So, Let's start by looking at some data and the typical patterns that we see. This is pretty standard uh, data that we get from social networks. You'll see these recurring diurnal patterns over and over again. Uh, it's these daily uh, uh, hills and troughs, right? So many people talk about a morning in the morning and then it dips down later that day because people you know, go to sleep at night. So you see, you see these recurring patterns every day. So here we see morning in red, we see coffee in green, uh, we see tired towards the end of the day. Lots of people say that they're tired. This is based off of Twitter data. So across all of Twitter, for example. This is a different query. Here we query uh, uh, party, right, in green. And you could see it's sort of slowly rising. You can all guess when the weekend happens here. Uh, beer is surprisingly consistent. There's no rise in the weekend, which is kind of weird. 
But in a way, this, this data that we have in social networks reflects us, right? Our society, our humanity, and it kind of shows us things we, we know about ourselves, right? Which is kind of great. This is a different query. Here we have, uh, in blue, uh, the hashtag Marcha Anti EPN, which was very popular uh, sort of student movement uh, last year in Mexico. Uh, in contrast, we have a TV show, True Blood, which aired that evening, and then the Tony's Awards, which happened the same day. Each event has a very different shape. And once we start understanding the norm and, and seeing these patterns recur in social networks, we can start to assess, OK, with, without doing any complicated analyses of, of the text itself, we can start to make pretty good guesses at what these events are, just judging, just judging by the shape of these trends. Here's a different uh, query. Uh, this was taken on election day, looking back uh, 48 hours. So we see three prominent hashtags uh, that were pretty popular uh, in the last elections. We see hash vote, people getting their friends out, making sure everyone votes, uh, which really spikes in the morning, right? Go out and vote. During uh, the middle of the day, we see I voted sort of become really popular, right? People self-reporting who they voted for or the fact that they voted. And then towards the end of the day, stay in line, which was actually really popular mostly here in Florida, uh, where everyone was using that hashtag to make sure their friends or anyone they're connected to would just stay in line here in Florida. Uh, even pizzas were sent using that hashtag, right, to the lines here. So we could see the evolution of events just by looking at the different shapes uh, of the and trails of these uh, hashtags or of these sort of mini events that are taking place. Uh, by the way, out of this uh, data set, we had some over 100,000 uh, um, people who, who wrote who they voted for. So sort of pro proclaimed, I voted for X or Y. And that's amazing, amazing data set, which nobody is using now, not even for exit polls. So a really great opportunity. Here's a different event. So Newtown shooting. We see it break, uh, you know, as the story break, that's pretty typical for a lot of these, uh, especially breaking news stories. And then there's, you'll see it sort of dies down, the amount of media attention and the amount of just general attention in the network. You see sort of the diurnal pattern the next day, a little more people talking about during the day. And then Obama visits, right? Massive spike in attention. So we can quantify that. We can see what effect that has on the conversation. Don't be scared of this plot. It really, uh, um, really should not be scary. This is, this is sort of a different way to look at um, similar type of data. So what we're mapping out here uh, is uh, the uh, Aurora shooting, right? And what we're seeing is when different cities light up. So we not only have the ability to see everything in aggregate, but we can start seeing where are people starting to be attentive. So the lower the city, the earlier people uh, in that city became attentive to the fact that uh, the shooting happened. So we start with Denver, which is not surprising. Uh, and we go up uh, Birmingham, Chicago, blah, blah, we eventually reach New York and LA, and then go international, right? The, the more persistent a line is, the more persistent the trend is within that city. So we have this amazing ability to map out not only uh, the shape of a trend, but also where it trends, where in the world people are attentive to it, uh, the, the span. So does the story, every story is different. Does it reach international cities? Does it reach certain cities within the US and it doesn't reach other other cities, um, and then how persistent it is. Does it stay sort of in, in people's attention, or does it you know, hit people's attention and then go away pretty fast? Here's an example of, of something that we could do with this type of, uh, of data. So this is an aggregated view over a few months. And what you see here is a notion of uh, volatility of trends. Um, the higher the graph is, and every color is a different city in the US, so, so the higher graph is the more topics happen that day. So the more sort of all over the place uh, attention was in that city. And the lower uh, places, the more focused uh, this is Twitter audiences were within that city. And what we see, the lowest point, this was last year, the lowest point in the graph, the point of most attention across all cities in the United States uh, was when Coney 2012 came out. 
right? So the, the level of, of attentiveness to that video, the amount of time it trended across these networks was the most we saw across all the different stories. So again, this is, first of all, just really important and interesting information about our media ecosystem, but also gives us the ability to quantify some of these things that we could never, ever quantify before. And we could start comparing Coney to Aurora shooting, right? How much atten attention was given there versus there? So a lot of the work that I do uh, has to deal with uh, data coming from social networks. Hence, we need to do a lot of network analysis. And I'll just give you a really brief overview of what it, what it means to run these network analyses. Um, so many times we have nodes which are represented as circles. We have uh, uh, nodes can be users, so they can connect you know, user A and user B. Could be Twitter, Facebook, whatever social network we're looking at. Uh, the edges are the connections between the nodes. And they could be multiple uh, properties, like they could be a friend connection, so I follow you, or, uh, or we both friend each other on Facebook. Uh, they can represent words appearing together. So I can use nodes to represent uh, one word and another word that appear often together, right? So we can use this, this type of structures to start looking at data and start analyzing, understand what it all means. Um, we, so there, there are a bunch of metrics that we can run on these types of graphs as we build them up. We see uh, uh, different notions of centrality. What is a central topic, a central person within this landscape that we're mapping out, right? And then we run some stats that help us understand what are the communities that we see. So I'll give you a quick example from the non-media world, and then we'll get to a, a, a journalism example. This is a, a map I did of uh, people who have the word Python in their description on Twitter. So Python is a programming language that I use a lot and I love dearly. Um, and this is an experiment. So to see if I take all the people who are active on Twitter for a certain period of time uh, and, and filter out everyone who doesn't have the word Python in their bio, uh, what do I see? What do I get? And build up this graph that represents people and then their connections, who follows who. Run some stats on them. Um, so the colors that you see here represent sort of groups that are much more interconnected amongst themselves. We use a, a metric called modularity on this graph. And what we see when we actually dive in, we see this really, uh, um, I mean, a structure that really stands out. It's, it's very clear that there are two dominant areas within this community and then a bunch of other sort of smaller regions. Uh, and when we dive into these profiles, it's very clear that the sort of light blue are uh, users in Japan, they're posting in Japanese. Uh, and then the dark blue are English, so from, uh, from the UK mostly and the US, right? People posting uh, in English code. And then you have sort of the Chinese coders, Spanish speaking clusters, et cetera. Note the one all the way on the left, that's the actual snake. And it's people like 247, at 247 snakes on Twitter who, who uh, loves pythons and other types of snakes, right? So we have that group too, but it's very clear that they're not a part of the main cluster, right? They're off on the side. So it's easy for us to um, sort of get, easily get rid of them if we're actually looking, trying to understand this community. So how can we use this type of technology on things that are relevant for journalism? If we do a very similar query on the debates, for example, the, hash, the main hashtag that was used for the debates, and look at uh, folks that have some affiliation to Ohio. Could be they're tweeting from Ohio, uh, different parts of Ohio, could be they're uh, in, in their location field, or any aspect of their profile pointing to Ohio. And if we grab all those users and we start mapping out the connections between them, we see similar structures emerging. So we see in yellow the sort of politicos and, and political profiles across, uh, um, across the state. Uh, in purple, we see sort of different media actors, right? And they're much more connected to each other than to the rest. This is a, another typical uh, thing we see in social networks called homophily, right? A characteristic in social networks, birds of a feather flock together, people who are sort of of similar affiliation or live in similar, in, in closer location tend to be more interconnected. Um, and in green we see uh, OSU students, right? Ohio State University. So once we understand the underlying structure, we can have so much more context about the conversations that are happening on the debates. Uh, so we can see um, 
we can effectively see, and we talked a lot about agenda setters uh, in, in the previous topics, but this gives us context to understand what are the agenda, what is the agenda that's being set by uh, these different clusters of users, right? We can see what are the dominant hashtags, what are the phrases, what are the links that they post to, right? And a lot of this is by, by knowing the underlying structure. This is a similar, uh, a very similar mathematical model on uh, the vice president debate, but in this case we have, instead of users as the nodes, we have words. Uh, so we're mapping out the conversation instead of the community. And what we're seeing are people's response to the vice presidential debate. And we can see which of the topics was sort of generated much more response. So 21% of all responses uh, were sort of fact checking, uh, around uh, fact checking, which is not surprising. There are one, only 1.8% 1 uh, of, the, of the users who were reposting about the debate talking about LGBT uh, topics and the fact that they weren't addressed in the vice presidential debate. So again, an amazing new way to quantify this type of stuff. The last example that I want to give you uh, is from a incre an incredibly popular social network in mainland China called Sina Weibo. And it's, it's mostly overlooked by us because, I mean, the language barrier is pretty difficult. Uh, but it's actually three times the size of Twitter. It's immensely used in China. Uh, and what we mapped here uh, was oh, during the Olympics, there was this uh, pretty heavily mediated event it, it mediated in mainland China around their hurdler, Liu Shang, who uh, failed at the hurdle race and sort of made a big show out of it. Now there's a lot of context behind that story. I'm not going to get into it, uh, but uh, Liu Xiang is sort of has become a popular icon in China. It's not every day that you have uh, an Olympic hurdler in mainland China do like really well around the world. Uh, so he became pretty famous uh, and actually got a lot of slack for you know hanging out with celebrities and doing TV shows instead of uh, practicing for the Olympics. Right. So there's a huge uproar when he failed in this race uh, and didn't didn't complete it. When we saw, we saw reactions um, within Weibo. Right? So what we see here are people responding to Liu Xiang uh, using a variety of words. And if we dive into the two sections of the graphs, we see sort of uh, accusations such as, you know, expected uh, Oscars. They were saying, oh, he acted as if he went to the Oscars, uh, his walk off of the track. Um, conspiracy, right? So p just people. Um, uh, using these types of words and accusing him uh, of not trying hard enough, and then his supporters, right? Dream, spirit, glory, proud, words such as that. And this is, this is really the first time that we have such a view into, uh, into people in mainland China, into, into their sentiment around these types of events. Uh, additionally, in Weibo, Sina Weibo, there's, uh, uh, there are a number of emoticons that you could embed within your posts. It's, it's an equivalent of a tweet, but you can add a little sort of emoticon. And this feature is heavily used. So around 40% of the users, uh, when they post something to Weibo, they add a little emoticon. Now, if you take this uh, information along with the event that you're mapping, you could start to see uh, the rise and fall in all these uh, sentiment uh, icons that's being used uh, by folks all across China. Uh, so we see sort of a decline in people being excited, right? He failed the race. Uh, they're not excited anymore for the race. Uh, but uh, not, people were not surprised, right? There's no rise in surprise. Uh, and, you know, a bunch of other, uh, we see people moved and sad, et cetera. So this is probably the only equation I'll, I'll show you today. Um, we live in a world of fragmented audiences, right? All these platforms, all these data streams coming from everywhere. Um, it, it means that we have very, very messy data to work with. But I say that's an amazing opportunity, right? We have to make sure when we get our metrics, when we, we define these new types of metrics, that they're in context, within the context of the network that we're looking at or the community that's being observed, right? And finally, we have to really understand how to take our analytics uh, uh, ability to the next level, uh, which has to involve graphs and networks. Right? How do we define central nodes within communities? How do we define central uh, conversations within a network of conversations? So I'm Gilad. I'm at Gilgul on Twitter. And I'll be here. So please, uh, uh, I would love your questions and thoughts. Thank you.